look back in hindsight Everything is 2020 In hindsight You make mistakes, we're learning from this In hindsight be your today and your tomorrow In hindsight It's so much clearer now Imagine a world where travel transcends time, where stories of love and war are told through the lens of virtual reality and historical fiction. How did a visionary entrepreneur merge these realms? Today, I have Henry Woodman, a pioneering force in the media and tech in media and technology from founding World Television, Travel Television. Hold on, let's say that again. World Travel Vision. There you go. And Ice Portal to his Emmy nominated media achievements. Henry's journey is nothing short of extraordinary. Good morning, Henry. How are you doing today? Excellently. And thank you for that wonderful intro. Now I don't need to say anything else. Look at that. You've covered it all. Uh, no, 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 no. I kept it really short so that you can do some talking. You've right? got a lot more than that little bit that I put out there. Awesome though. Thank you. Bring it on. Where are you calling in from today? South Florida. Oh, wow. How's the weather there? It's pretty hot here in California. Yeah, it's hot. And just <laughs> like uh, South Florida, now my dog is scratching at the door because I closed the door. Jeez, Louise. Yeah, yeah mine it, too. <laughs> it, it's hot and it's humid. You know, it is right. South Florida. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's I know it's been hot. Like usually I complain I complain about the heat here in California, but it looks like the whole country is getting a taste of it right now, so I'll just, you know, we'll just yeah. suffer here together, right? Yeah. Where in California are you? It's about 65 miles north of San Diego. So you're so, in Orange County. Yeah, I'm a little bit I'm in Marietta if you're familiar or Temecula, okay. the wine, yeah, yeah. the little Temecula. wine country. There you go. Hey, yeah, what's yeah. the What's the photo in the background? I see Henry. I got that. But I see the Superman. I mean, the superhero. Yeah, there you go. What's that? So, you know, one year in my company, instead of uh, giving a lot of bonuses, we did a little bit of bonus, but everybody got a superhero picture. Right? Awesome. So uh -huh. we would get their image, which was my face up there. <laughs> and uh -huh. it says Henry. And then my company logo there in that thing and so everybody got a superhero picture which was phenomenally well received they loved That's it dope. and yeah. of course I did one for myself as well it was like a <laughs> christmas gift and i i'm sure everybody still got them somewhere that's nice. I like it. I always like checking out the background, but I never really asked, but that one stood out. I looked at you in another, I looked at you in another uh, podcast and I was like, Oh, I hope he still has the same, you know, you're in the same room when I talk to you. Usually there's a dog back here too, yeah. or two, three of them, but I, I closed the door. So I hear scratching. So I'm sorry for that. If you can hear it. Oh no, I don't. I don't. It's all good. Hey, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Like I said, I, I didn't really you know, I scratched the, the tip of the surface, like I'm way up here, but you got some some innards. Uh, so just tell us just a little bit about yourself before we get going. And then we'll talk about this pioneering virtual reality and all those other great things that you did. Absolutely. And and thank you, Lee. I, mm -hmm. I think the, the, the uh, sort of going from above and looking down, I would look back and I would consider myself very much a hedonistic and opportunistic entrepreneur, meaning mm -hmm. I really do things that one, I really like to do because I enjoy it or it's something that interests me mm -hmm. or it is something that I stumble upon that I go, wow, what, there's an opportunity there. You know, I, I actually take advantage of that. And so almost all of the things that I have done fit into those categories um, from you know, early on when I was a 13 year old, I went to Mexico for a swim meet. I came back, I, I brought a switchblade. Right. And this is 1973, right? You can do that on airplanes. Easily. That, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so in junior high, all of the kids are like, man, that's the coolest thing ever. I want one. And I'm like, oh, so I ended up getting a lot of orders. I flew back to Mexico by myself as a 13 year old, bought wow. a bunch of, you know, like a little cases of large and small switchblades and sold them around <laughs> junior high. Jesus, that's awesome. I, I was contributing to the delinquency <laughs> of my junior high fellow students. That is a cool story. So how did you do in the swim meet? I usually end up in the top three or something. I was a, I was a competitive swimmer all through high school. And yeah. then you know, I got so tired of swimming. I went to college to play water polo. And then in the second year, they dropped the team because they wanted to put more money into football. So got it. Got it. But you found that entre entrepreneurial spirit during that trip to Mexico. 
Yeah, that. And, you know, when I was younger, I got into photography and I, I mm, set up yep. a dark room in my bathroom. So I printed flyers and I walked around the neighborhood and I gave it to all, of, you know, I was 15, <laughs> gave it to put it in the mailbox of all the neighborhood uh, houses. And, and I think more out of pity, they would call and go, oh, look, the neighbor kids doing, you know, pet portraits. Let's <laughs> let's hire him. And, you know, I take a picture of their dog or cat or whatever, you know, squirrel they had. And mm -hmm. I'd put it in the uh, in the bath in the dark room and do an eight by ten or a five by seven and give them a couple of prints and make some money. Nice. Your dad was your dad entrepreneurial. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was a book writer. A I know he's a writer. And he ended up uh, with a, an advertising agency called Travel Advertising. Did you learn a lot from him? Did you a learn lot of what yeah. not to do? <laughs> I mean, hey, that's just as important, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, I think I think in large part it was an inspiration. You know, you okay. can kind of travel around and have your own sort of set. You know, you, you have a different visualization of what an entrepreneur does when you're younger. And then, mm -hmm. you know, once you get into it, you realize, you know, besides the passing thing like, you know, switchblades or, you know, uh, uh, doing pet portraits. Once you get into a, a real ongoing concern, it's a different animal. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And that's hopefully we can get into some of those lessons and things that you've learned along the way. Right. Um, you know, you said you were an opportunist, so you see these things and, and you'd have an opportunity. I didn't really find a way. I mean, I wasn't flying to Mexico at 13 and things like that, but I didn't really find, you know, the, the, I didn't make the connection mentally. Right. And I believe a lot of people don't make that connection for entrepreneurs. Right. And I love on the entrepreneurial spirit. I do things entrepreneurially now, but still I'm not I'm like one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. So yeah. when I when I talked, when I saw some stuff about you, uh, I was excited to have you on the show. Because you've done a lot of things. You've dabbled in a lot of amazing things. It's not even like switchblades. I mean, that's amazing because it's, <laughs> it's 13 years old. So that's what makes that story so cool. But me, I just got excited because I want to be more all in, if yeah. you know what I mean. I want to be able to disconnect. So no pressure to you. <laughs> right to get me there over the finish line. Now, you know, I, I want to say, too, there's, there's a difference between – you know, seeing something and acting, you know, mm -hmm. I see an opportunity, I'm going to do something about it. Or as opposed to seeing something going, man, somebody should do something. Yeah. Somebody who, right. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. It was kind of the next thing I did. So now I'm in college, right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, 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 I have an addiction at the time. I'm addicted to video game machines, particularly Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So there I am sitting in a laundromat with a pocket full of quarters. I'm not really willing to crack the books or study. And I'm thinking, man, this place needs a Pac-Man. Jeez. Mm -hmm. So I, I call every laundromat in Tucson when I went to college in Arizona. And I asked them if they had video game machines. In, in first, you know, I wanted to go somewhere where I could, you know, play video games while I'm waiting for my clothes to wash and dry. Mm -hmm. And all of them said no. So I said, would you like one? thinking, you know, maybe if I have that problem, somebody else has that problem. And here's an opportunity because at the time you'd have to go to a video arcade thing in like a mall or 7-Eleven or something. So I said, you know, I'll share the revenue with you. And they went, a couple of them said, sure. Now, the problem was I didn't have any money. I'm a college student. And so mm -hmm. I took some of my college funds, which probably not a good idea. But I went to an auction and I bought one machine that was used and outdated. You know, when you go to an arcade and they have all these machines and one of them, nobody ever plays and it's mm -hmm. not making money for them. So they get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was it. Right. I think it was called Frisky Tom. So I <laughs> bought the machine. I put it in a laundromat and, you know, lo and behold, made money. And so then I bought a couple more and then I would switch them around knowing that the audience, the, you know, the, the people yeah. that are doing their washing their clothes, they would go, God, what a piece of junk. Right. And they come back and go, finally, they figured out to put a new one in here or a different yeah. one. Right. So that, that was kind of the opportunity. Listen, I wanted to play Pac-Man. I'm a hedonist and there was no Pac-Mans in video. I mean, in, in, in laundromat. So let's do it. Right. Okay, so let me ask you something. Was it that simple? Had you no. seen that anywhere else? No, I, I had not. I saw it in, in 7-Elevens and I saw it in places. And I think, 
you know, part of the reason was the fear factor of being a machine in a place that didn't have attendance, if you will. And, and then I learned later mm. that the 24 hour laundromats were probably not the best ones because people would just come in and break the machine open and yeah. take the orders. Right. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it was uh, already an established ideal where if you want to play Pac-Man or whatever video game, you'd go to an arcade mm -hmm. or you'd see them at your local 7-Eleven. And that was enough. Uh, they really didn't take into account there's a group of people that have two hours that they almost forced to be somewhere. And even if they didn't have a pocket full of quarters, there was a dollar bill changer that would give you the quarters in that establishment. So, yeah. <laughs> I tell, I tell, the reason why I asked this question is because I remember going into laundromats and there be vending machines or places where it just didn't really make sense because I was the guy who would go, the kid that would go ride my bike to the arcade. And 7-Eleven, you, you, you're taking me back. 7-Elevens did have arcade games back then. It's pretty cool. I just want to know, were you the one who like made that connection? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, you know, I, 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 was on a, I was on the East Coast too. I, was, I grew up in Maryland. I yeah. don't know where you grew up at. You're in Florida. I grew up, I, I grew up in South Florida, but you know, okay. college was in Arizona, so it's in Tucson. Ah, uh, so you're on the other side. Know, gotcha. Once I graduated, I sold the business in order to go and move to Los Angeles. You know, I didn't yeah. make a, a lot of money selling the business. I just wanted enough to live for a couple of months without having to stress, right? And that was kind of the goal. I, I said to the, the buyers, I said, look, I don't really need all the money up front. Yeah, I'd be better off if you pay me, you know, every month for the next mm -hmm. two years, like a thousand dollars. That was pretty much what it was. Right. And that could make me, you know, in nineteen eighty three, I could live for a thousand dollars a month, right? And so they would send me oh. the money enough to just I, I don't have to stress too much. You know, you say you didn't make a lot of money, but I tell you what. You created some money, you know what I mean? And that's that entrepreneurial spirit. Like you was like, huh, one and two, uh, I do got to wash clothes. They already got the coin machine in here. Let's throw this. I mean, you, you saw an opportunity and you created money yeah. for yourself. And then you um, built off of that. Well, you started with the knives. So let's, let's not discount. Yeah. Let's I wanted to play video game machines, but I didn't want to stab anyone. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you progressed a little bit. As a 13-year-old, it's kind of cool to push a button and a blade pops out and you think you're cool. So you're trying yeah. to impress your friends. You, you mentioned a few lessons. One, about 24 hours and, and not really having the security kind of needed for the machines. What is a major lesson that you learned in, this, in your earlier years about entrepreneurs? I keep saying the word. I apologize. I am going through some allergies and some sinus things right now. So... <laughs> Me trying to say some of these words is just blowing me up. Uh, so I just want to put that out there for the listeners. I apologize to you, Henry. All right. All right. Uh, so one of the lessons I learned early, I don't know that I cognitively realized that I was learning lessons. I think the lessons were kind of like, ooh, yeah, that sucked. Okay, well, let me not do that again. And, you know, because when you're younger and you don't have a lot to lose, which yeah. was my case, Oh, so what? You know, somebody breaks into the machine. It wasn't a so what. It was like, ah, damn. Okay, well, I'm obviously, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to yeah. move that machine and not put a machine in this place, right? Right. Um, the other thing, you know, there was an IBM facility nearby, and somebody was moonlighting on on uh, for me to fix the machines. You know, I didn't realize that, you know, these were intricate little circuit board thingies that I didn't know how to fix it, right? So. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a relatively simple machine and I would just use logic that I had if, if you know, like the, 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 I knew some of them would slowly lose favor because they were not great machines because mm -hmm. you know, bought them on the cheap. And if I move them and it was something new, then, you know, I could re, you know, new blood into the, the live stream of that, that laundromat. So I think that learning to, you know, move them around, if you will, learning mm -hmm. to not to avoid the places where uh, they're going to get broken into and I'm going to lose money. Right. Right. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it was more a solopreneur type thing, you know, where I didn't have a bunch of people. So I didn't really need to get a structure or any long term vision. It was just kind of I got to make a little bit of money on the side. I want to go play video game machines. And, you know, that was that was the extent of the excitement. All right. So that was the extent of the excitement from your college mental mind. In hindsight, 
when you look back <laughs> from this mind right here, what kind of lessons did you learn? And, I, and I'm, I'm going to stop beating you up on this topic. <laughs> no, but I just oh. want to, you know, learn some things that you learned early that you took with you as yeah. you went on your journey. Sure. That's a good question because in hindsight, it's a great name for the podcast, by the way. Um, <laughs> In hindsight, I think what I learned was just to enjoy it. And I think more importantly was good. You're fulfilling a, you're, you're solving a problem. Even mm -hmm. if it's a problem that I had, you're solving a problem that will then get you or benefit you, get you some, some funds. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like I would think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. Cause it's really cool. I like clothing and I'm going to do another clothing shop in the downtown, you know, main street. Ooh, that's what, who has that problem? Right. <laughs> um, and, and I think when I look back at, and at almost everything, that's why I say hedonistic and opportunistic is okay. What was the problem and what was the opportunity and why did you see that? And then mm. only as I got into a more legitimate business, the last one I sold was where I really learned how to structure and, and, you know, put the processes into place so that I could scale. Okay. If I look back, I think the hindsight would have been how to then scale that business or expand into other areas. But, you know, I'm in college. And so yeah. I had a, I had a, a footprint and, and I didn't care as much. Had I had a more business focus, I would have said, okay, what are in other areas? What's in Phoenix? What's in Southern California? What's in New mm. Mexico? What in the other areas that I can do the same thing and just shuttle these things around and or franchise it to the other cities and say, listen, you manage it. I'll get you the machines and I'll maintain it. And yeah. share revenue. Got it. Okay. All right, cool. Appreciate it. All right. Now we're going to shift just a little bit. Virtual reality, 360 degree panoramic, panoramic photography. Man, I was in love with that. What yeah. inspired you to, I'll use the word pioneer this type of well, photography. It, it, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to get there. So, you know, okay. I, I, I moved to LA, then I started doing travel films, right? And, and one of the areas I shot for Eastern Airlines was in Chile, right? Mm -hmm. And so the production company we used, we became friends and Chile's democracy, I mean, dictatorship with Pinochet became a democracy, right? Mm. And as a result, there were new television stations and a new television network added to the country, which meant they're starting fresh and they need content, right? So thus the big opportunity thing mm -hmm. starts flashing. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to have my production partner friend down there set up a meeting with the new network. I got mm -hmm. on a plane. I, I ripped off an idea from a, a show in the U.S. I packaged it and I went, I said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to call it Machos. So we produced a game show in Chile called Machos. And the other opportunity is Chile was a young demographic at the time. Mm -hmm. And the older station, it was called Catolica, was focused on, you know, the people running the country, you know, a bunch of old farts, right? <laughs> right. So it did really well. But okay. after a year in Chile, I start seeing this thing called digital editing, where you can cut and paste, you know, images and move them around. I was like, oh my God, that's the coolest <laughs> thing ever, right? Right. Then I see this 360 degree panoramic view where you can literally with a CD-ROM at the time, mm -hmm. you can click and you can move all around and look at a room on a computer screen. And I thought that is so cool. Yeah. I want to do this. I don't want to do travel films because I don't have to travel with, you know, five guys and 17 pieces of luggage. I can just take, you know, so I bought the world's first one shot camera. Hmm. that would take a picture of the entire room with one image, right? It was still, it wasn't a digital camera. It was a film camera right. shooting a parabolic mirror, but then you'd you know, have all this stuff. Okay. So I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to do virtual reality for travel and hospitality, right? Hmm. So I buy the camera. I set up the company called World Travel Vision. Hmm. And so I'm doing virtual tours and I'm giving the, the clients CD-ROMs. They would take them to trade shows and conferences. And eventually, this is probably the mid to, you know, latter part of the 90s, they start asking, how do we put these virtual tours on this new World Wide Web thingy? Mm. I'm like, I don't know, send them a CD-ROM. Yeah. And they said, yeah, we, we have, but they don't know what to do with it. There are no standards, right. right? It required an app to play it. So I said, all right, well, whatever. I, I, let me do, let me know what I can do to help and let me, let me figure it out, right? I'll help you. 
So we started just, you know, taking the virtual tours to the travel sites, you know, the Expedias and the Orbitzes and the travel cities, right? Yeah. And then we started digging in a little bit more and we realized, well, there's a bigger problem then that's a nice to have. It's nice to have virtual tours. A need to have is pictures. At the very minimum, hotels right. have to have pictures. So when we started looking into that, the next opportunity that presents itself is the internet comes along, all of the rate and availability information is already stored in these massive computer systems. They call them GDSs, like Sabre, right? GDS, okay. But they don't have pictures, right? So mm -hmm. the internet comes along and they've got to add pictures. Mm -hmm. And the pictures mm -hmm. have to go with you know, hotel codes, room codes, room types. There's a lot of stuff that goes beneath the surface. And so they'd upload individually. The hotels didn't upload stuff that met the brand standards. I mean, it was, it was, oh, it wow. wasn't fun. If you right. remember in the, I guess the late nineties, early two thousands, when you'd go to the internet and you'd see a hotel site or mm -hmm. a, a, a booking site and it said picture not available. You're yeah. Like, All right, well, I'm not going to book that. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of the next opportunity, which were, was Ice Portal. That was the, the, the growth scale business, you know, mm -hmm. managing and distributing images for, you know, hotels to deliver everywhere. Uh, so my next question is kind of funny that you would say it like that. World Trend Travel Vision to Ice Portal. So yeah. are these the same company and it was rebranded? So what's Correct. the story? Yeah. What's the story behind the rebranding? So what happened was World Travel Vision was a simple production company, you know, okay. and anybody with a camera and a computer was a competitor, right? Okay. And so when I looked at the opportunity and I said, okay, the real value isn't in the production of this content. The value mm -hmm. is in the distribution of the content. <clears throat> okay. So we would go to hotels and we would say, you know what, we'll shoot your virtual tours for next to nothing. You got mm -hmm. them free. I'll give you a CD-ROM, mm -hmm. but I also want you distribute that, to distribute them. Right. I'd send these what, what we call digital brochures for the hotels to the travel Stop. sites. Wow. Right? Yeah. And then eventually when I realized that there's a problem with the photos, it was a challenge for many hotels and the management companies and the representation companies. Mm -hmm. So my partner at World Travel Vision was much younger. He was the techie guy. And I said, listen, we're going to have to build a completely new platform to distribute the content. And we're probably not going to be able to pay ourselves for the better part of nine months to a year. Okay. And he says, I can't do that. I said, OK, well, I'll buy you out, which is probably the best thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I bought him out and we converted from World Travel Vision to ICE, which is Internet Content Exchange Portal. Okay. Is an acronym. OK. And so the idea was. Eventually, we would do the virtual tours as loss leaders, and then we would morph into photography because we already had the connections. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we just say no to anybody who wanted virtual tours. So, you know, we at, at the beginning, we say yes to everything. And eventually, we started to say no because we thought we could be the best at this one thing. So what kind of challenges? I mean, besides, you know, losing your partner at the time or buying them out. So, you know, it's the best decision in hindsight. But what challenges did you face? while establishing ice portal as a leader in the visual co uh, visual content management. Sure. Well, yeah. we certainly didn't start out as leader. And I said, the biggest challenge was my own lack of knowledge, right? right? Yeah. We'll get into the competitor and the, you know, the, the, the challenges we had with, with them if you want. But at the end of the day, you know, when I start an ongoing concern, because most of the others, there's a beginning, a middle and an end, and it wasn't yeah. an ongoing business, right? Mm -hmm. With ice portal, you know, structuring a business that you say, okay, what's the vision? Why are we here? What are we doing? You know, where are we going? Right. And then when people would say to me, you need to hire the best people. And mm -hmm. I'm like, are you kidding me? I can't even pay myself right. for the best people. Right, I, don't even, right. I don't even know what that means. Right? You need to have <laughs> right. the right culture. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Somebody handed me a book called Traction by Gina Wakeman. Mm -hmm. The biggest change of my life. When I read the book, the light bulb went off and I went, Oh my God, I, I bought the book. We only, at the time we were only six of us. So I bought six books. I gave them to all the employees. I said, this is our Bible. Mm -hmm. We ended up using our technology backdoor password was Gino Wickman. He was, he was the author of the book. Right. And eventually when people would say, okay, what's the vision? Where are we going? Right. Okay. Got it. Well, here's where we're rowing. And here's what we believe is our culture. You know, mm -hmm. we'll visit it every year. Here are the KPIs, the key, you know, the key indicators that the performance indicators that we want to live by. Here's the culture. 
And because we were a tech company, we would have daily huddles with the entire team. And we would try to repeat, hey, did anybody see, you know, one person would lead it every week. Did anybody, uh, did you see anybody use something that uh, signifies the culture this week? Did you or anybody, and just let's talk about it real quick. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah. constantly gets repeated. So the challenge is for me really, and you know, and I went back to school. I was in my 50s. I went to uh, get my MBA because I thought, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing. It's the imposter syndrome coming mm. in full force. And there are people running businesses. They know what they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. So I went back. I got my thing. I, I started to put the processes and the structures in place and slowly scaled. Yeah. Wow. Slowly. I mean, slowly over 20 years. Hey, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's pretty awesome. I like how you touched on certain things, imposter syndrome. And instead of you staying stagnant or being frustrated, maybe you were frustrated, right? But you took action. You went back to school to try to figure out what it is I don't know that I need to know. Sure. Right. Sure. So good lesson on that one. I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, I and even in school, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm taking MBA courses with people that were half my age and yeah, I really was into it because now I'm in college and I'm, I'm actually interested in what I'm learning because I can mm. apply it to the business. Right. Yeah. But the students that were in the class with me, they didn't really care. They were just there because they wanted to get a degree so they can get a better paycheck. That's, mm -hmm. That was pretty much it. And I'm yeah. thinking, wow. Yeah. So it's, you know, I don't remember anything in college. I didn't really spend a lot of time studying or thinking, oh, this is going to be really valuable. I ought to know this. I was having fun, you know, yeah. drinking beers yeah. and chasing women. Yeah. Good perspective. <laughs> good perspective. Now you're there with a purpose. Exactly. Exactly. Now there was a reason for going to school. Yeah. 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 I like it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Shiji Group, did they acquire Ice Portal? Yep. They and, did. And Thank God. How did that impact your professional trajectory? Well, you know, at the time, because I had these ideas in my mind, you know, you need to make so much revenue because you multiply your EBITDA, you know, you'll sell for a certain percentage or multiple of your EBITDA, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, groups would come by as we started to grow and we gained, uh, you know, market share. We had one competitor and we just, you know, they had they had signed exclusive deals. And when those exclusives ended, we went from 1000 hotels, that was Starwood to 22,000 in less than six months. So we started to grow like crazy. Wow. And we were we were scaling and we were prepared. So anyway, make a long story short, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Shiji and a couple other people come and they say, Look, we're really interested. And I mm -hmm. said, Yeah, listen, I'm always interested, but I don't know that I'm ready yet. Mm -hmm. And you know, they said, Why? And I said, Well, you know, I need to get to this number. Right. Mm -hmm. I had a number on my mirror for a decade. So they say, yeah, whatever. They leave a month mm -hmm. later, they call me up and they fly in the CFO and the COO. And, you know, they're a big multi-billion dollar international company. And, you know, they start throwing out a bunch of numbers. Okay. And I say, listen, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I make really good money because I was doing well at the time. I don't have a board. I don't have a boss. I don't have any debt. I sleep well at night. So mm -hmm. now I'm coming from a position of strength, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have, this is my number. You, and I told them, I said, you will overpay today for something you will underpay for tomorrow. Right. And I shut up and they looked at each other and, and, you know, there was silence for, you know, it was probably 10 or 12 seconds, but it's felt like minutes. Right. Yeah. And they, they finally said, fine, you got a deal. And so no investment banker, no dog and pony show. 60 days later, money was in the bank. I was happy as a clown. Good, good. Yeah, and they even said, you know, we, we want to do this as an earn out. I said, I won't take an earn out. There's no way. You never know what's going to happen. And you know what right. happened? COVID. Mm. So you think of the hospitality space. Every hotel on planet Earth had to shut down. Mm. Every So, you know, we Hilton and, and, and Wyndham, the world's largest hotel group, they were clients of ours. So... You know, imagine one or two regions, one or two hotels, maybe a state. Ah, it's not a big deal. But yeah. turn off the faucet for every single property, but you still have to pay the overhead and the GNA and the insurance. Right. I mean, come on. That's a problem. Woo. Yeah. I'm still lucky. I'm still grateful. <laughs> you should be. You did some amazing things. Uh, I got it. You got, hey, you make your luck. You make your luck. You know, now that you say that, because I, I, you know, I, when I coach uh, the smaller businesses to try to 
let them know things that I didn't know at the time. I always say there are two things. If you're interested in having opportunity present mm-hmm. itself, right? You need to be standing on the corner of prepared and lucky. Mm-hmm. If you're prepared and you're not lucky, you may not see opportunity. If you're a lucky person and you're not prepared, you may not see opportunity. Mm. But the best chance you're going to have is to prepare well and hope for luck and opportunity will find you. There it is. There it is. Wow. All right. I looked at this word and I was in need media. Anamoya. Say it again. Anamoya. 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 Okay. What motivated you to co-found Animoea Media? And before we even get to that, explain the name. Okay, so Animoea really is a, a feeling like I've been here a, a time or a place before. Okay, okay. I and, like it. And that's relevant because there's two things. When you, when you want to get a URL and a name this mm-hmm. day and age, everything's taken, right? Unless you want to pay a gazillion dollars for a URL. So Animoea was indicative of, you know, been there. I feel like I'm having a deja vu. It's an animoya. Okay, got mm. it. Mm. So what made what motivated you to, to uh, co-found that and venture into TV and film projects? God, you got yeah. you've done so <laughs> so many. Yeah. I love photography. First of all, I got my little Sony camera and things like that. None of that 360 panoramic view, black. Uh, what is it called? The the dark room. All of that. I'm off straight digital. So yeah. I love I love photography though, and then I also love. TV and films. Now I'm not sure what type of projects, but this is the life I could have seen myself in the different projects and things that you've worked on. So I'm going to sit back, I'm going to shut up and you tell us a little bit about uh, this, uh, this, uh, Anna, 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 yeah, Anna Maya. Yeah. I'm, I'm Anna Maya. Well, it's funny because many of the previous stories I've said, okay, let me take you back to tell you how I got there. And you can see the connection, you know, from, yeah. Okay. I, I, video, maybe not so much. Video, I mean, video machines. So I go to LA right after college and I'm thinking to myself, I want to be a producer director. That does not happen. Mm-hmm. Now, while I was in Los Angeles, you know, and I had a little bit of money to survive from the video game business in, in college. Um, my father, who was a travel uh, guy, was also a travel writer. And he wrote a book, a manuscript, if you will, for a friend Mm -hmm. of his, a love story that he didn't really plan to publish. Mm -hmm. He's moving and my sister's helping him move. And she says, what is this? He explains it's a love story. Mm -hmm. She's like, dad, a love story? Come on. (laughs) Can I read it? So my sister reads it, falls in love with it, calls me up and she says, oh my God, daddy wrote this love story. It was amazing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. She sends it to me sits on my nightstand for, I don't know, months until one night I finally read it. I couldn't put it down. I was in tears. I called dad. I said, dad, I love this. This is amazing. Hmm. Can I buy the rights. And he's like, sure. So I don't have a lot of money, so I'll give you a buck. So I buy the rights. And uh, then I think to myself, oh, geez, you know, it's kind of nepotistic of me to think dad had this great story. I mean, it's my dad, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I call a friend of mine who at the time was producing a movie. And I said, Doug, can you read this and just tell me what you think? And he says, Henry, I'm in the middle of something. So I, I'm producing something now. Can, can you, can you wait? I'm like, sure. I got plenty of time. Mm-hmm. Three days later, he calls me up because this was unbelievable. We are meant to do this. Let's do this. Right. I'm like, great. Anyway, he finished his movie. The distribution, uh, Vestron was the company at the time, which is out of business, uh, gave him a raw deal. He was disappointed. I moved to Chile to do the game shows. He ended up getting into real estate. We stayed in touch. That was 40 years ago. Right. Wow. So I still have this m- movie thought in my brain. Mm-hmm. Right. So I say to Doug, I say, listen, when I sell ice portal, we're going to then do this. And now opportunity. Now the opportunity is much greater because 40 years ago, there was a handful of distribution studios and channels. It wasn't yeah, big. True. It was, you know, movies or a couple of TV ch- uh, channels. That's it. It's, it's nothing. Now there's a lot more need for content, right? Right. So I said, instead of a movie, let's convert this into a document, uh, not a documentary, a six part limited series with the first season. So the book is a paranormal romance with historical fiction. And the series is a far deeper dive into this mm. genre, right? right? Which is 
you know, Lee, have we been in a previous life together? And if so, what was the connection? Am I, do I owe you? Is there a karma that I have to pay for? Or did I, did I do something bad and now I have to pay for my sins? You know, these yeah. are the types of questions. One, do soulmates exist? Does reincarnation, does time travel exist? Is there a metaverse? I mean, we don't answer the questions, but they're there. Yeah. Gotcha. What's the, give, give the name of the book. Well, the name, the name of the book is called the reincarnation of Marie. Marie. Right. And, and, and really there is a woman, she existed by the way, uh, her name was Marie Bashkirsev. Mm -hmm. She died at 24 between mm -hmm. 14 and 24. She was writing a journal and she was also an artist and her paintings are in museums around the world. Wow. But her journal was published after her death and it became an international bestseller. I mean, this right. is a woman who would write about things that in the late 1800s, you wouldn't even talk about, you know, sexuality and masturbation and things like that. Right. 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 So a hundred years later, this guy picks up the journal and he reads it and he falls in love with her through her written word. Mm -hmm. But then he realizes, geez, I, I've fallen in love with a dead person. I mean, he's visited places she's been to. Yeah. She, she was, he lived in Paris. He's gone to the tomb where she was buried in, 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 Montpa, in Passé. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I, 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 this is crazy. I, I fall in love with a dead woman. Then he mm. finds her reincarnation. Mm. The series essentially goes into, okay, did they know each other in the previous life? Were they soulmates? Did something happen where they get together? Is this good? Are there, is there karma or sins of the father? There's a lot going on here. I mean, the book yeah. is, is this passionate little, uh, linear story and the series is, you know, connecting a lot of dots. I tell you what, if, if you can weave a love story into a, an amazing science fiction type genre thing for me, I'm all in. Hey, is this, has this been, is it streaming somewhere? No, we, we, we literally just published the book, right? Okay. So the book, is, the book is the concept, if you will, the springboard to develop the series. So because, reincarnation of Marie. Yeah. Be, okay. Be, because, you know, if you want, I can send you the link there. There's a link to the, we have a website where the book and then the series and a little bit about my dad, he passed 14 years ago. Okay. Uh, it's called MarieTheStory.com. Okay. And that identifies the book, uh, places where it's sold, obviously the series. And the, the goal for us is because I'm not in a rush anymore and I want to do this right. Yeah. I wanted to publish the book first, which is what I just did. Right. And then I want to go out and get the pitch deck done, which is, uh, you know, here's some appealing mm -hmm. things like a deck uh, and give it to showrunners who fit that type of genre that have mm -hmm. done paranormal type things and maybe like Outlander, if you will. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so then they get the director and the cast together, even though we have lists of people we like. Right. And yeah. with that, you can go to a streamer. It's different than it was 40 years ago. Yeah. You can go to a streamer a and, and, you know, bargain what the, uh, the deal, where you're going to produce it, who's going to be involved and so on and so forth. I don't intend to be the producer. I intend to be the executive producer because okay. I know, en I know enough to know that I don't know enough. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, how many languages do you, do you speak, Henry? Three. All right. I just wanted that before I ask this question. Yeah. Yeah, four if you count the language of love, but I think I'm losing that in my old age. <laughs> hey, how has your tri trilingual ability influenced your work in the global media landscape? Yeah, well, obviously, the first is, you know, traveling to Chile to pitch a, a game show to the Chilean television yeah. network, is not in English, right? Yeah. And because Spanish, you know, I, 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 I know Spanish well. I married a Venezuelan woman. Then mm -hmm. it was easy to the point where they said, who's going to be the, the, uh, you know, the, the host of the show. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. Let's find somebody because why don't you do it? You'd be great. A gringo in. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I didn't want yeah. to tie into that. Um, but my Spanish was good enough to sell it. And, you know, I live in South Florida, just like mm -hmm. you know, Southern California. Right. Like people speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what personal experiences shaped your uh, perspective on the power of storytelling? You started off with photography. Obviously that tells stories, but you know, what kind of experiences and you had a lot, you've given, you've given a lot in this few yeah. minutes that we've talked. So that's kind of a crazy question, but. No, it's a great question. Storytelling is huge. First of yeah. all, we express things through stories. 
right? Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't tell you facts. Okay, this, 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 but who cares, right? Mm-hmm. Now, when you're younger and you go and see a movie and you don't have distractions like, you know, now we do with all social media and phones, and you're so engrossed in this thing, you're taken away. That's a story. Mm-hmm. Or you read a book like, like, like the reincarnate, you know, the reincarnation of Marie, I read 40 years ago when I was in tears. And then when I went to republish it, I read it again. Mm-hmm. And I was in tears again. Okay. And one of my mentors, um, I gave it to him. I said, listen, I want you to read this. And he says, Henry, towards the end, I had to put it down because I, I was too emotional. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. love to hear that because that's a story. And the, the story is, it's told to my father and my follow, my father relays the story in the book to his friend who falls in love with this woman. So it's wow. a guy telling a story about right. somebody else who told him, listen, I'm going off to war and if something were ha- to happen, I just need somebody to know because this is so crazy. Yeah. I just don't want to, you know, I don't want to go and not have it known somewhere. Okay. That's kind of the idea. So stories, I, I digress a little bit and I apologize late, but stories no, good. are hugely important because yeah, yeah. People hear stories. People listen to stories. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And there is power in the ability of being a powerful storyteller. So I appreciate it. You've already encouraged me to go ahead and look at this, read this book. Hey, is it an audio book? I drive oh, a lot. Yeah, yeah. I drive so, a lot. So I, I, I know. And you know, it's funny, as I said to the publisher, I said, you know, I, I'm very lazy and I don't like to read. Um, we're going to have to do an audio book. Um, uh-huh. Should I just get a voice talent? What, what do you suggest? And she says to me, she goes, well, you know, you have a pretty good voice. Why don't you, you do? do I was thinking that too. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And I said, well, I have a face for radio, but you know, a voice. <laughs> so she says, you should do it. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I, uh, well, you know, it might be a nice thing as a tribute to dad. Okay. 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 So the book, yes, it does have an audio book. Good. I am the voice over, but I'm sorry because I'm not an actor. So I don't get to like, I don't know how to say. And then she said, quote, I'm going to do this because it sounds horrible. Right? <laughs> so I just say it the way I'm going to say it. Right. And then ironically, my nephew, my mm-hmm. brother's son, who is also grandson of my father, is a virtuoso pianist. And he does the Chopin music transitions between oh, wow. the chapters. So you'll okay. hear the writer, my father. The son does the narration and the grandson does the music transitions on the piano. That's dope. All right. So all right, you sold me. That's going to be, <laughs> oh, that'll be my next book that I'm going to listen to. So uh, cool, as soon man. as I get off of here, I'm going to be checking that out. Cool. Thanks. But what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs in the media and technology sectors? Yeah. I'm going to say your thoughts create your life. It mm-hmm. all boils down to that. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll use a para- Here's a story. Here's a paradoxical analogy, right? The difference between drowning and treading water is very small with respect mm-hmm. to movement. It's huge with respect to energy mentally and physically. So if I'm drowning or I, th- I think I'm drowning, mm-hmm. my mind is racing, my arms are flailing, my legs are kicking, and I'm pretty much not going anywhere, much less down right yeah if i'm treading water my mind is much calmer my muscles are being less taxed i'm casually Mm. treading water now sounds easy but to get from drowning to treading water comfortably takes practice right it's the same thing in business and in life you don't Mm. just say well you know to solve all your problems just think it through or meditate jeez i do that but it takes years if not decades to master and you never really master it right yeah so think what you think becomes what you are and what you be and even in the times where you think the world is coming to an end just try to look at the bright things like i've got a roof i've got food yeah. i've got security i'm not going to die okay yeah right yeah. wow because there have been times where you just think the world's coming to an end and you just panic and you don't yeah. think clearly. Yeah. Wow. Powerful. Powerful. All right. I always tell people I simplify that and say, well, I was in the army and, you know, things happen. I used to always just say, hey, it's just a moment in time. Get your mind right. 
especially when we used to do our PT, you know, our physical training. It used to, it used to be intense uh, when I was in Hawaii. And uh, I lead the guys, and we were in formation, and we'd be running. And we were getting ready. It would look to be the end of the run, but I know how our leadership is. And I'm like, guys, get your mind right. Get your mind right. We're not going in there. It's just a moment in time. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. All these little, you know, catchphrases and stuff like that. And uh, bottom line is it's not the end of the world, like you said, until it is. Sometimes it is. But for the most part, you can create it being the end of the world just by how your mind works. You can see yourself through it. Yeah. So great words I mean, of advice. Let, let's be clear, Lee. Yeah. Nobody would say, listen, it was just a straight, easy path. It was easy. Without those no. challenges and those hurdles, this is where yeah. we learn and grow. So yeah. there is a bit of gratitude for that. It's like going to the gym. I, I mean, I, I have a little mm. bit of pain from <laughs> doing my exercises, but it's to, to, to grow, right? And it's the same thing with, with entrepreneurship. You, yeah. uh, unless you're one of those rare few like Instagram, a year later, you sell for a billion dollars. That's, that's rarer than lightning in a bottle. So you've got to mm -hmm. know shit is going to hit the fan from time to time. And hopefully you can learn from it. Uh, and if need be, pivot. That's it. Good word. That's another, that's another uh, key word. Pivot. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but is there, is there a subject or project that you're currently passionate about that you'd like to discuss that we, or something that we just haven't talked about? You know, as, as you know, and sort of the pun intended, the, the last chapter of the, the, saga here is to go full circle you know when i wanted to produce and direct movies in my teens and then i ended up here in my 60s thinking you know what now i can do the things what that i want to do i don't have to stress about oh my god i need to put money on the in the bank i need to put food on the table and those things so the passion really is to do something that you enjoy or that you have some sort of feeling or purpose for you know it drives me crazy when i see people that say Oh my God, this work, I can't wait to retire and do nothing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And after yeah. like two weeks, you're going to be bored out of your mind. Do mm -hmm. something, even if it's volunteer or free or whatever. Right. So right. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't have anything besides, you know, going full circle and trying to fulfill that childhood dream to produce uh, and create a TV series. Right. Awesome. And where can the listeners connect maybe with you or learn more about your work sure well the, the website uh, marie the story.com gives a lot of that information also has a contact page okay if they are interested they can always go to linkedin and look up henry woodman you know okay. it'll, it'll say henry woodman in south florida Hanamoya media is the company so mm -hmm. Uh, I'm fairly easy to find. I'm not in the witness protection program yet. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the, the easiest that they, if they can remember is mariethestory.com and that will take them to the website that has contact information, has information on the book and the series. All right. Hey, Henry, it's been enlightening, an enlightening conversation today. Just diving into your journey from pioneering travel technology to creating timeless stories and media. And thank you for sharing your insights and experience with me and with the listeners. And to our listeners, stay tuned and subscribe to Hindsight the Podcast and catch more inspiring stories like Henry's. See you next time. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining me here on Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And while I have you here, why don't you take your mouse and go over and click on that subscribe button? No, no, not right there. Over to the right. To, no, no, down, down, right, right there. Boom. Thank you. Now, thank you for subscribing to Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones.